Okay, three, two, one, it's jam. What's up, science fam? By now, you should already know that everything in this universe is made up of matter. And matter has the basic fundamental unit called the atom. And atoms are super tiny. And so what brilliant mad mind was able to think of the concept of the atom? My name is Saramon and this is Science with Saramon. And for this topic, we're going to talk about how the atom concept developed through the ages, the history of the atomic model. All right. So for this topic, we're going to discuss how each model of the atom improved upon what came before it, how each subatomic particle was, dis was discovered, and how the quantum mechanical model, the present model, explains the energies and positions of electrons. So let's do this. So if we try to think of something small, and then try to divide it into something smaller, then try to divide it even smaller in your mind, and so on, until you get to the smallest possible thing that can no longer be divided. That is the philosophical concept of the atomos. The atomos is the smallest indivisible particle thought up by Democritus, a Greek philosopher, also known as the laughing philosopher, because his philosophy is that cheerfulness is the basic fundamental good. So according to him, the atomos is an indivisible particle that has the same material no matter where you find it and it comes in different sizes and shapes. It's the indivisible, par indivisible particle that makes up all matter in the universe. Alright, so he just literally thought about it. No experiments, no science and so on. Pure philosophy. So when was it taken seriously? When did it become science? It came much later on with John Dalton the father of the atomic theory. So he's the first one to actually back up his atomic model with an atomic theory. But he pretty much based it on all on Democritus philosophy. So his model is called the solid sphere model, literally just a ball. It's a ball, guys. I don't know what to tell you. So it helped explain his atomic theory, but the problem is it didn't talk about the subatomic particles. It's not actually completely indivisible. But, according to his atomic theory, all matter is made of atoms. All atoms of the same element are identical, so they have an ID as elements. And compounds are combinations of two or more different types of atoms. So that means that if you have the same atoms all together, that's still not a compound. And a chemical reaction is a rearrangement of these atoms. So one of these postulates, the one that's color-coded, actually proved to be false. We'll talk about that later on in the form of isotopes. So, who did better than Dalton? Who actually discovered something better than something that could make his atomic theory that proves mostly true today? So, this guy, J.J. Thompson, is basically the pudding guy. He made a, he made a model of the atom that's based on pudding. So, he discovered this, the subatomic particle, the electron, and he got results from what we call the cathode ray tube experiments. So, in his experiments, he just used a cathode ray tube, which is basically a cathode and anode that sends a beam of negatively charged particles outwards. So that beam is usually straight, but when he put a negatively charged and positively charged metal plate on either end, it started bending toward the positive plate. That means that the particles must be negatively charged because it's repelled by the negative plate and attracted to the positive plate. Now, it'll only stay as a ray of particles if those negative particles have a weak positive charge that holds them together. So his model became the plum pudding model. So he thought of the positive cloud of charge as a uh, pudding of positive charge while the toppings, the plums, are the electrons, tiny, tiny electrons. So he accommodated the presence of electrons in his atomic model, but he didn't know about the nucleus yet. Okay, so what was next? Who actually figured out the nucleus? We have Ernest Rutherford. This guy looks like he's done with life. So he's the radiation guy. He discovered radioactive decay and the atomic nucleus, or specifically just the protons, the positive part of the nucleus. So he got his results from the gold foil experiments. So the gold foil experiment is when he shot a laser beam of alpha particles from, radioactive, uh, from a radioactive source. And those alpha particles, since they're positive, he expected them to just go through. If it's according to Thomson's atomic model, it'll go through that weak positive charge. But instead, 
it got scattered, which means that there must be a dense positive center of the atom. So his model is the nuclear model. There's a nucleus that's very dense in the center and it's positively charged. The electrons just orbit around, mostly empty space, around the nucleus. So it explained that there's electrons, it explained that there's a positive charge, but the positive charge is condensed, it's not a cloud or a pudding. But what he didn't have is that the orbits of the electrons are all the same, and he didn't explain anything about the orbits of the electrons. So improving on that is the next guy, Niels Bohr. He used math and the quantum theory in order to explain the different energy levels that electrons can have. So his model is called the planetary model. So it actually gave a uh, new theory, new atomic theory based on Bohr's model. So according to him, electrons have specific values of energy and momentum, meaning you can actually trace them each to have orbitals. They orbit around the nucleus in a certain way based on their energy and their momentum. The more energy it has, the bigger its orbital. So you can see here, the farther it is, the more energy it has. Nearer things have smaller orbits and less energy, farther things have more energy. Now, because they orbit around the nucleus, it creates circular electron shells. It's like a spherical shell around the nucleus. And the electrons can release and absorb energy. So that means that they can actually release energy and go to a lower orbital or absorb energy and go to a higher orbital. So again, Niels Bohr's atomic theory is just about how electrons can hold energy, can orbit based on that energy, and they can also release energy. Now, one of these postulates proved false, which is the circular electron shell, which will be improved upon in the next model. So his planetary model basically gave a better model for electron orbits and energy. It explained very light elements like hydrogen and helium. But the problem is that for heavier elements, this model breaks down because it doesn't explain how the properties of the atoms are related to this planetary model. It just doesn't make sense. They would collapse into the nucleus or collide with each other. So the one who actually clarified this couldn't clarify this without the next principle. So an important principle or theory was discovered or put forth before the next model and it's by this guy. So Heisenberg looks like a mad, mad scientist who's got blackmail material on you. He's the uncertainty guy. So he worked on quantum mechanics with Niels Bohr and figured out that we can't measure some things and be sure of them at the same time. Or in other words, the uncertainty principle. So in this case, you can't precisely measure both position and momentum at the same time because electrons are too tiny and too quick moving, too moving too fast in order for you to measure both of them at the same time. If you focus on position, you can't tell its momentum very well. If you focus on momentum, you can't figure out its relative position very well. So the better you measure one, the worse you measure the other. So again, uncertain. Because of uncertainty, we need to have a model that takes into account that uncertainty and works on probabilities instead of actual discrete paths for the orbitals. In comes Erwin Schrodinger, the, the guy who suggested cats in boxes. He didn't actually put cats in boxes. He was trying to prove a point against Einstein. He said that Einstein's quantum mechanical theory is, you know, crap because you can't have a cat that's both alive and dead at the same time in a box. So he worked on an atomic model that considered uncertainty and worked with probabilities instead. So here we have his atomic model. It deals with clouds of probability or electron clouds. Instead of orbitals where you would find it just spinning around in that orbit, it's a cloud of probability. You can at any point in time look into that cloud of probability and more likely than not, you'll find the electron in that cloud. Okay? It's less likely to appear outside of that cloud. So these clouds have specific shapes because he treated electrons not as particles but as waves because of how tiny and fast moving and energetic they are. They function as waves generating probability clouds. So we have the quantum mechanical model. So they don't just have a distance from the nucleus or a discrete orbital. They have clouds of probability where you might find an electron at any given time. So this is the currently accepted atomic model, but he didn't know about neutrons yet. So this isn't the end of the 
atomic model developing further. Okay, we'll take up the neutron and how the atomic structure was figured out next time. So the quantum mechanical model explains a lot about the atom's structure and properties of each electron. You can see here that there's, it's not just a circular or spherical shape. It can take on many shapes and sizes based on the energy and the momentum of the electrons. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about electron configuration. But basically, key point, it's the little things that matter. It's neither simple nor indivisible. Sometimes in life, you have to look at the little things because they're the things that make a difference. All right? So that's pretty much it. I'll see you guys next time. That is over.